Section One of Idols of the King. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Idols of the King, by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Dedication. These to his memory since he held them dear, perchance as finding there unconsciously some image of himself. I dedicate, I dedicate, I consecrate with tears, these idols. And indeed he seems to me scarce other than my king's ideal knight, who reverenced his conscience as his king, whose glory was redressing human wrong who spake no slander, no, nor listened to it, who loved one only and who clave to her, her, over all whose realms to their last isle, commingled with the gloom of imminent war, the shadow of his loss drew like eclipse, darkening the world. We have lost him. He is gone. We know him now. All narrow jealousies are silent and we see him as he moved, how modest, kindly, all accomplished, wise, with what sublime repression of himself, and in what limits, and how tenderly, not swaying to this faction or to that, or making his high place the lawless perch of winged ambitions, nor a vantage-ground for pleasure. But, through all this tract of years wearing the white flower of a blameless life, before a thousand peering littlenesses, in that fierce light which beats upon a throne and blackens every blot? For where is he, who dares foreshadow for an only son a lovelier life, a more unstained than his? Or how should England, dreaming of his sons, hope more for these than some inheritance of such a life, a heart, a mind as thine, thou noble father of her kings to be, laborious for her people and her poor, voice in the rich dawn of an ampler day, far-sighted summoner of war and waste, to fruitful strifes and rivalries of peace, sweet nature gilded by the gracious gleam of letters, dear to science, dear to art, dear to thy land and ours, a prince indeed, beyond all titles, and a household name, hereafter through all times, Albert the Good. Break not, O woman's heart, but still endure. Break not, for thou art royal, but endure remembering all the beauty of that star which shone so close beside thee that ye made one light together but has passed and leaves the crown a lonely splendour may all love his love unseen but felt or shadow thee the love of all thy sons encompass thee the love of all thy daughters cherish thee the love of all thy people comfort thee till God's love set thee at his side again. THE COMING OF ARTHUR Leodegran, the king of Cameliard, had one fair daughter, and none other child, and she was fairest of all flesh on earth, Guinevere, and in her his one delight. For many a petty king ere Arthur came ruled in this isle, and ever waging war each upon other, wasted all the land. And still from time to time the heathen host swarmed overseas, and harried what was left. And so there grew great tracts of wilderness, wherein the beast was ever more and more, but man was less and less, till Arthur came. For first Aurelius lived and fought and died, and after him King Uther fought and died, but either failed to make the kingdom one. And after these King Arthur for a space, and through the puissance of his table round, drew all their petty princedoms under him, 
their king and head, and made a realm, and reigned. And thus the land of Cameliard was waste, thick with wet woods, and many a beast therein, and none or few to scare or chase the beast, so that wild dog and wolf and boar and bear came night and day, and rooted in the fields, and wallowed in the gardens of the king. And ever and anon the wolf would steal the children, and devour, but now and then her own brood, lost or dead, lend her fierce teat to human sucklings, and the children, housed in her foul den, there at their meat would growl, and mock their foster-mother on four feet, till straightened they grew up to wolf-like men, worse than wolves. And King Laodegran groaned for the Roman legions here again, and Caesar's eagle. Then his brother King, Urian, assailed him. Last a heathen horde, reddening the sun with smoke and earth with blood. And on the spike that split the mother's heart, spitting the child, break on him, till, amazed, he knew not whither he should turn for aid. But, for he heard of Arthur newly crowned, though not without an uproar made by those who cried, He is not Uther's son, the king sent to him, saying, Arise, and help us thou, for here between the man and beast we die. And Arthur yet had done no deed of arms, but heard the call and came, and Guinevere stood by the castle walls to watch him pass, but since he neither wore on helm or shield the golden symbol of his kinglyhood, but rode a simple knight among his knights, and many of these in richer arms than he, she saw him not, or marked not if she saw, one among many, though his face was bare. But Arthur, looking downward as he passed, felt the light of her eyes into his life smite on the sudden, yet rode on, and pitched his tents beside the forest. Then he drave the heathen, after slew the beast, and felled the forest, letting in the sun, and made broad pathways for the hunter and the knight, and so returned. For while he lingered there, a doubt that ever smouldered in the hearts of those great lords and barons of his realm flashed forth and into war. For most of these, colleaguing with a score of petty kings, made head against him, crying, Who is he that he should rule us? Who hath proven him King Uther's son? For, lo, we look at him, and find nor face, nor bearing, limbs, nor voice, are like to those of Uther whom we knew. This is the son of Gorlois, not the king. This is the son of Anton, not the king. And Arthur, passing thence to battle, felt travail and throes and agonies of the life, desiring to be joined with Guinevere, and thinking as he rode, Her father said that there between the man and beast they die. Shall I not lift her from this land of beasts up to my throne, and side by side with me? What happiness to reign a lonely king! Vexed, O oh, ye stars that shudder over me, O oh, earth that soundest hollow under me, Vexed with wasted dreams! For saving I be joined to her that is the fairest under heaven, I seem as nothing in the mighty world, And cannot will my will, nor work my work wholly, nor make myself in mine own realm victor and lord. But were I joined with her, then might we live together as one life, and reigning with one will in everything have power on this dark land to lighten it, and power on this dead world to make it live. Thereafter, as he speaks who tells the tale, when Arthur reached a field of battle bright with pitched pavilions of his foe, the world was all so clear about him that he saw the smallest rock far on the faintest hill, and even in high day the morning star. So when the king had set his banner broad at once from either side with trumpet blast and shouts and clarion shrilling unto blood, the long-lanced battle let their horses run. And now the barons and the kings prevailed, and now the king, as here and there that war went swaying. But the powers who walk the world made lightnings and great thunders over him, and dazed all eyes, 
till Arthur, by main might, and mightier of his hands with every blow, and leading all his knighthood through the kings, Carados, Urian, Cradlemont of Wales, Claudius and Clariance of Northumberland, the king Brandagoras of Latingore, and Anguissant of Arran, Morganor, and Lot of Orkney. Then before a voice as dreadful as the shout of one who sees to one who sins, and deems himself alone and all the world asleep, they swerved and brake flying, and Arthur called to stay the brands that hacked among the flyers. Ho! They yield! So, like a painted battle, the war stood silenced, the living quiet as the dead. And in the heart of Arthur joy was lord. He laughed upon his warrior whom he loved and honoured most. Thou dost not doubt me, king, so well thine arm hath wrought for me to-day. Sir, and my liege, he cried, the fire of God descends upon thee in the battlefield. I know thee for my king. Whereat the two, for each had warded either in the fight, swear on the field of death a deathless love. And Arthur said, Man's word is God in man. Let chance what will, I trust thee to the death. Then quickly from the foughten field he sent Ulfius and Brastius and Bedivere, his new-made knights, to King Laodegran, saying, If I in aught have served thee well, give me thy daughter Guinevere to wife. Whom, when he heard, Laodegran in heart debating, How should I that am a king, however much he hope me at my need, give my one daughter saving to a king, and a king's son? lifted his voice, and called a hoary man, his chamberlain, to whom he trusted all things, and of him required his counsel. Knowest thou aught of Arthur's birth? Then spake the hoary chamberlain, and said, Sir King, there be but two old men that know, and each is twice as old as I, and one is Merlin, the wise man that ever served King Uther through his magic art, and one is Merlin's master, so they call him, Leus, who taught him magic. But the scholar ran before the master, and so far that Bleus laid magic by and sat him down and wrote all things and whatsoever Merlin did in one great annal-book, where after years will learn the secret of our Arthur's birth. To whom the king Laodegran replied, O oh, friend, had I been holpen half as well by this king Arthur as by thee to-day, then beast and man had had their share of me. But summon here before us yet once more Ulfius and Brastius and Bedivere. Then, when they came before him, the king said, I have seen the cuckoo chased by lesser fowl, and reason in the chase. But wherefore now do these your lords stir up the heat of war, some calling Arthur born of Gorlois, other of Anton? Tell me ye yourselves, hold ye this Arthur for King Uther's son? And Ulfius and Brastius answered, Aye. Then Bedivere, the first of all his knights, knighted by Arthur at his crowning, spake. For bold in heart and act and word was he, whenever slander breathed against the king. Sir, there be many rumours on this head, for there be those who hate him in their hearts, call him base-born, and since his ways are sweet and theirs are bestial, hold him less than man. And there be those who deem him more than man and dream he dropped from heaven. But my belief in all this matter, so ye care to learn. Sir, for ye know that in King Uther's time the prince and warrior Gorlois, he that held Tintagel Castle by the Cornish Sea, was wedded with a winsome wife, Igern, and daughters had she borne him. One whereof, Lot's wife, the Queen of Orkney, Bellicent, hath ever like a loyal sister cleaved to Arthur but a son she had not borne. And Uther cast upon her eyes of love. But she, a stainless wife to Gorlois, so loathed the bright dishonour of his love, that Gorlois and King Uther went to war, and overthrown was Gorlois and Stain. Then Uther in his wrath and heat besieged Igern within Tintagel, where her men, seeing the mighty swarm about their walls, left her and fled and Uther entered in, and there was none to call to but himself. So, compassed by the power of the king, 
enforced was she to wed him in her tears, and with a shameful swiftness. Afterward, not many moons, King Uther died himself, moaning and wailing for an heir to rule after him, lest the realm should go to rack. And that same night, the night of the new year, by reason of the bitterness and grief that vexed his mother, all before his time was Arthur born, and all as soon as born delivered to a secret postern-gate to Merlin, to be holden far apart until his hour should come because the lords of that fierce day were as the lords of this, wild beasts, and surely would have torn the child piecemeal among them, had they known. For each but sought to rule for his own self and hand, and many hated Uther for the sake of Gorlois. Wherefore Merlin took the child and gave him to Sir Anton, an old knight and ancient friend of Uther, and his wife nursed the young prince and reared him with her own and no man knew. And ever since the lords have foughten like wild beasts among themselves, so that the realm has gone to rack. But now this year, when Merlin, for his hour had come, brought Arthur forth and set him in the hall, proclaiming, Here is Uther's heir, your king, a hundred voices cried, Away with him, no king of ours, a son of Gorlois he, or else the child of Anton, and no king, or else base-born. Yet Merlin, through his craft, and while the people clamoured for a king, had Arthur crowned. But after the great lords banded, and so break out in open war. Then, while the king debated with himself if Arthur were the child of shamefulness, or born the son of Gorlois, after death, or Uther's son, and born before his time, or whether there were truth in anything said by these three, there came to Cameliard with Gawain and young Modred, her two sons, Lot's wife, the Queen of Orkney, Bellicent, whom, as he could, not as he would, the king made feast for, saying, as they sat at meat, A doubtful throne is ice on summer seas. Ye come from Arthur's court. Victor, his men report him. Yea, but ye, think ye this king, so many those that hate him, and so strong, so few his knights, however brave they be, Hath body enow to hold his foemen down? O king, she cried, and I will tell thee, Few, few, but all brave, all of one mind with him. For I was near him when the savage yells of Uther's peerage died, And Arthur sat crowned on the dais, and his warriors cried, Be thou the king, and we will work thy will who love thee. Then the king in low deep tones and simple words of great authority bound them by so straight vows to his own self, that when they rose, knighted from kneeling, some were pale as at the passing of a ghost, some flushed, and others dazed, as one who wakes half blinded at the coming of a light. But when he spake and cheered his table round with large, divine, and comfortable words, beyond my tongue to tell thee, I beheld from eye to eye through all their order flash a momentary likeness of the king. And ere it left their faces, through the cross and those around it and the crucified, down from the casement over Arthur smote flame-colour, vert and azure in three rays, one falling upon each of three fair queens, who stood in silence near his throne, the friends of Arthur, gazing on him, tall with bright sweet faces, who will help him at his need. And there I saw mage Merlin whose vast wit and hundred winters are but as the hands of loyal vassals toiling for their liege. And near him stood the Lady of the Lake, who knows a subtler magic than his own, clothed in white samite, mystic, wonderful. She gave the king his huge cross-hilted sword, whereby to drive the heathen out. A mist of incense curled about her, and her face well-nigh was hidden in the minster gloom. But there was heard among the holy hymns a voice as of the waters, for she dwells down in a deep, calm, whatsoever storms may shake the world, and when the surface rolls hath power to walk the waters like our Lord. There likewise I beheld Excalibur before him at his crowning born, the sword that rose from out the bosom of the lake, and Arthur rode across and took it, rich with jewels, elfin Urim on the hilt bewildering heart and eye. 
the blade so bright that men are blinded by it. On one side, graven in the oldest tongue of all this world, take me, but turn the blade and ye shall see, and written in the speech ye speak yourself, cast me away. And sad was Arthur's face taking it. But old Merlin counselled him, Take thou and strike, the time to cast away is yet far off. So this great brand the king took, and by this will beat his foemen down. Thereat Laodogran rejoiced, but thought to sift his doubtings to the last, and asked, fixing full eyes of question on her face, The swallow and the swift are near akin, but thou art closer to this noble prince, being his own dear sister. And she said, Daughter of Gorlois and Igern am I. And therefore Arthur's sister? asked the king. She answered, These be secret things, and signed to those two sons to pass, and let them be. And Gawain went, and breaking into song sprang out, and followed by his flying hair ran like a colt, and leapt at all he saw. But Modred laid his ear beside the doors, and there half heard, the same that afternoon struck for the throne, and striking found his doom. And then the queen made answer, What know I? For dark my mother was in eyes and hair, and dark in hair and eyes am I, and dark was Gorlois, yea, and dark was Uther too, well nigh to blackness. But this king is fair, beyond the race of Britons and of men. Moreover, always in my mind I hear a cry from out the dawning of my life, a mother weeping, and I hear her say, Oh, that ye had some brother, pretty one, to guard thee on the rough ways of the world. Ay, said the king, and hear ye such a cry. But when did Arthur chance upon thee first? O oh, king, she cried, and I will tell thee true. He found me first when yet a little maid. Beaten I had been for a little fault whereof I was not guilty, and out I ran and flung myself down on a bank of heath, and hated this fair world and all therein, and wept and wished that I were dead. And he, I know not whether of himself he came or brought by Merlin, who they say can walk unseen at pleasure. He was at my side, and spake sweet words, and comforted my heart, and dried my tears, being a child with me. And many a time he came, and evermore as I grew greater grew with me, and sad at times he seemed, and sad with him was I, stern too at times, and then I loved him not, but sweet again, and then I loved him well. And now of late I see him less and less, but those first days had golden hours for me, for then I surely thought he would be king. But let me tell thee now another tale, for Bleus, our Merlin's master, as they say, died but of late, and sent his cry to me, to hear him speak before he left his life. Shrunk like a fairy changeling lay the mage, and when I entered told me that himself and Merlin ever served about the king, Uther, before he died and on the night when Uther and Tintagel passed away, moaning and wailing for an heir, the two left the still king, and passing forth to breathe, then from the castle gateway by the chasm descending through the dismal night, a night in which the bounds of heaven and earth were lost, beheld so high upon the dreary deeps it seemed in heaven, a ship, the shape thereof a dragon winged, and all from stern to stern bright with a shining people on the decks, and gone as soon as seen. And then the two dropped to the cove, and watched the great sea fall, wave after wave, each mightier than the last, till last a ninth one, gathering half the deep and full of voices, slowly rose and plunged roaring, and all the wave was in a flame. And down the wave and in the flame was born a naked babe, and rode to Merlin's feet, who stooped and caught the babe, and cried, The king! Here is an heir for Uther. And the fringe of that great breaker sweeping up the strand lashed at the wizard as he spake the word, and all at once all round him rose in fire, so that the child and he were clothed in fire, and presently thereafter followed calm, free sky, and stars. 
And this the same child, he said, is he who reigns, nor could I part in peace till this were told. And saying this, the seer went through the strait and dreadful pass of death, not ever to be questioned any more, save on the further side. But when I met Merlin, and asked him if these things were truth, the shining dragon and the naked child descending in the glory of the seas, he laughed, as is his wont, and answered me in riddling triplets of old time, and said, Rain, rain, and sun, a rainbow in the sky, a young man will be wiser by and by, an old man's wit may wander ere he die. Rain, rain, and sun, a rainbow on the lea, and truth is this to me and that to thee, and truth or clothed or naked, let it be. Rain, sun, and rain, and the free blossom blows, sun, rain, and sun, and where is he who knows? From the great deep to the great deep he goes. So Merlin riddling angered me, but thou fear not to give this king thy only child Guinevere, so great bards of him will sing hereafter, and dark sayings from of old raging and ringing through the minds of men, and echoed by old folk beside their fires, for comfort after their wage-work is done, speak of the king. And Merlin in our time hath spoken also, not in jest, and sworn though many men wound him that he will not die, but pass again to come. And then or now utterly smite the heathen under foot, till these and all men hail him for their king. She spake, and King Laodegran rejoiced, but musing, Shall I answer yea or nay? Doubted and drowsed, nodded and slept, and saw, dreaming, a slope of land that ever grew, field after field up to a height, the peak haze hidden, and thereon a phantom king, now looming and now lost, and on the slope the sword rose, the hind fell, the herd was driven, fire glimpsed, and all the land from roof and rick in drifts of smoke before a rolling wind streamed to the peak, and mingled with the haze and made it thicker, while the phantom king sent out at times a voice, and here or there stood one who pointed toward the voice, the rest slew on and burnt, crying, No king of ours, no son of Uther, and no king of ours. Till with a wink his dream was changed, the haze descended, and the solid earth became as nothing. But the king stood out in heaven, crowned. And Laodegran awoke, and sent Ulfius and Brastius and Bedivere back to the court of Arthur, answering, Yea. Then Arthur charged his warrior, whom he loved and honoured most, Sir Lancelot, to ride forth and bring the queen, and watched him from the gates, and Lancelot passed away among the flowers, for then was latter April, and returned among the flowers in May with Guinevere, to whom arrived by Dubric the high saint, chief of the church in Britain, and before the stateliest of her altar shrines, the king that morn was married, while in stainless white the fair beginners of a nobler time and glorying in their vows and him, his knights stood round him, and rejoicing in his joy. Far shone the fields of May through open door, the sacred altar blossomed white with May, the sun on May descended on their king, they gazed on all earth's beauty in their queen, rolled incense, and there passed along the hymns a voice as of the waters, while the two swear at the shrine of Christ a deathless love. And Arthur said, Behold, thy doom is mine. Let chance what will, I love thee to the death. To whom the queen replied with drooping eyes, King and my lord, I love thee to the death. And holy Dubric spread his hands and spake, Reign ye, and live and love, and make the world over, and make thy queen be one with thee, and all this order of thy table round fulfil the boundless purpose of their king. So Dubric said, but when they left the shrine great lords from Rome before the portal stood, in scornful stillness gazing as they passed. 
Then, while they paced a city all on fire with sun and cloth of gold, the trumpets blew, and Arthur's knighthood sang before the king. Blow, trumpet, for the world is white with May. Blow, trumpet, the long night hath rolled away. Blow through the living world, let the king reign. Shall Rome or heathen rule in Arthur's realm? Flash, brand, and lance, fall battle-axe upon helm. Fall, battle-axe, and flash, brand, let the king reign. Strike for the king and live, his knights have heard that God hath told the king a secret word. Fall, battle-axe, and flash, brand, let the king reign. Blow, trumpet, he will lift us from the dust. Blow, trumpet, live the strength and die the lust. Clang, battle-axe, and clash, brand, let the king reign. Strike for the king and die, and if thou diest the king is king and ever wills the highest. Clang, battle-axe, and clash, brand, let the king reign. Blow, for our son is mighty in his may, blow, for our son is mightier day by day. Clang, battle-axe, and clash, brand, let the king reign. The king will follow Christ, and we the king in whom high God hath breathed a secret thing. Fall, battle-axe, and flash, brand, let the king reign. So sang the knighthood, moving to their hall. There at the banquet those great lords from Rome, the slowly fading mistress of the world, strode in, and claimed their tribute as of yore. But Arthur spake, Behold, for these have sworn to wage my wars and worship me their king. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. And we that fight for our fair father Christ, seeing that ye be grown too weak and old to drive the heathen from your Roman wall, no tribute will we pay. So those great lords drew back in wrath, and Arthur strove with Rome. And Arthur and his knighthood for a space were all one will, and through that strength the king drew in the petty princedoms under him, fought, and in twelve great battles overcame the heathen hordes, and made a realm, and reigned. End of section 1